there is uh, some first things I want you to look at. The first thing that any witness must know is that they're saved. Why? Well, because if you're going to have something to tell, you got to have something to tell. Uh, you say, well, preacher, that sounds ex extremely uh, simple. I understand that. Uh, but there comes uh, a time in the life of every child of God when we come under Holy Spirit conviction, John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, and the Holy Ghost to God does that work that He does in conviction in showing us the wickedness and filth and ungodliness of our sins and explain to us that uh, if we don't get saved, we're going to hell. Right. Right. Now, you don't hear much about hell anymore, and uh, that, that makes it real interesting to me because the truth of the matter is, most folks are going to hell. Yeah. But there is a remedy. Hallelujah. It is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and we bless the Lord for that and thank Him for that. Must know repentance and faith. And you say, well, I don't know if I prayed and, and repented. I guarantee you, if God changed your life, you repented. Yeah. Stay with me. Yeah, we, we like to talk today about surrender. I surrendered. I surrendered. Everybody I talk to about Jesus, and they say they're a Christian, they talk about surrendering, and I say, well, how about change? What did God change in your life? The sign of repentance is the fact that God does change those things in our life. Thirdly, the peace of God, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, how do I know I'm saved? Well, I know I'm saved because I was there when it happened. Whoopie do. I know I'm saved because I did exactly what the Scripture says to do. Well, you can do that and still be lost. Hello? How do I know I got saved? Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified. Saved by faith. We have present tense right now. Had it yesterday, got it today, I'll have it tomorrow. We have peace with God. I asked a little boy if he got saved. He said, yes, sir. I said, have, I took it in Romans 5.1. I said, you got peace? Yes, sir. I said, explain it. He said, I can't. I said, then how do you know you got it? And he, he said, well, pre preacher said, uh, I don't know, but I'm telling you, I got it. And I said, yep, yep, you got saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, you can't explain peace, but I'm telling you, when it settles in on your soul, you know it. There's no doubt about it. Amen. Well, the second thing uh, any witness must apprehend is the meaning of the gospel. We just talked about that. The third thing that any witness must comprehend is the normal desire of any Christian to be a witness. Look, turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and look at verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. This is very familiar to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Here's what it says, But ye shall receive power, Acts 1, 8. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And then verse 9, he's taken up from them. So his last command is our first responsibility. Amen? And the answer is no. Read the verse, preacher. Out loud. Find me a command. Oh, I preached it like that for years, and one day I read it. <laughs> you know, there's no command. I, I said, well, now, now folks, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be educated. God just made me do a doctorate, okay? I said, well, I go back to my Greek. Now, folks, listen to me. My final authority is right here. The Greek is a commentary on my King James. Y'all got that? But in the Greek, if it's a command, it's got to have a command form. It has no command form. It's not a command. It's a statement of fact. So when did you get the Holy Ghost? When you got saved. And when you got saved, God made you a witness. It's the most natural thing in the world for any 
child of God to do is to be a witness. I have for almost 50 years asked folks two questions when they get saved. Number one, did God save you? I'll guarantee you, you don't have to give them assurance. They got saved. They know it. Number two, what do you want to do now? 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, they want to go tell somebody. They want to tell a preacher. They want to tell their mama. They want to tell their sonny. They want to tell somebody. It's just natural. You say, well, I, I really hadn't, you know, I really don't have that. Well, maybe you need to get saved. Or maybe if you are saved, you just need to get an altar this morning and ask God for a burden. Amen. Y'all are getting quieter on me. Hello. Let's go on. The fourth thing any witness must grasp is Christian compassion. That's that burden that we talked about. Now let's look at some character traits and habits of an effective witness. Number one, a devoted repentance life. You say, well, I repented when I got saved. I, I don't know about you, but i got to repent every day. I told the preacher I missed a Mennonite couple this morning. The, they told me what, the, what you know, Mennonites kind of believed, and I was just, uh, we, don't, we don't have many Mennonites down where we are. And so I was interested in that and, and uh, walked away, and the Lord said, you didn't even ask them if they saved. Well, yeah, all Mennonites are saved. Oh, yeah, that's like all Baptists are saved. Hello. <laughs> uh, there's got to be a compassion in our heart. God's got to do that. And that comes with a repentance, a, a repentance life. It's called separation. Here were some folks who were separated. I don't know that uh, they didn't do it for their salvation. Separation. Said Job eschewed evil. To depart from, put aside, turn aside, cross the street, revolt against. We revolt against sin because why? Sin becomes revolting to us. Now Romans 1.1, 1, 1, he said we're separated to something. We're separated to the gospel. How do you get separated from something? You get separated to something. You say, I'm having trouble with a particular sin. Put your Bible under your arm. Go knock on the door. Go in and tell somebody about Jesus. I'll guarantee you the Holy Ghost of God will deal with that sin in your life. Hmm. Look at the second one. A daily prayer life. Now, if you look at the last page of your syllabus, I love this. Folks, listen, I'm just simple. Amen. I don't have nothing except a black back King James Bible and Jesus in my heart. But that simply means when I got him, I, I got to pray. Amen. I, I, I don't know about you. I said prayers before I got saved. I quit saying prayers after I got saved. Amen. It's a prayer list for lost folks. Extremely simple. The date you start praying for them, their name, and the date they get saved. This gives you the opportunity that every time you meet somebody that's lost, you put their name on your prayer list, and you can call their name in prayer every day. Amen. It will remind you. The second thing you got was a ways to pray for a missionary. I love this. I hope you'll use those. Uh, now, understand something, folks. We are powerless because we're prayerless. The one thing we've lost in Baptist churches is a separation to prayer. You say, well, preacher... Uh, do you pray every day? Oh, yeah. See, the good thing about it is my wife, uh, she told the Lord years ago if he'd wake her up, she'd get up early in the morning. So I got to bed all to myself, and it's a great prayer altar. What you laughing about? Well, it is. Amen. And I can run over my prayer list, and I can pray for things, and I can get right with God and start the day on hallelujah ground. Amen. But, folks, listen. There's also something about a church coming together and praying. Most of the time in our prayer meetings, we're more concerned with keeping sick folks out of heaven than we are keeping lost folks out of hell. 
<clears throat> and we need to pray. Pray. If you expect lost folks to get saved, you better pray. <clears throat> Is there power in the gospel? Oh, yeah. Give them the gospel? Yeah. But I'm telling you, that work of the Holy Ghost of God, it's got to happen in their lives. And it takes prayer. Now, how do you learn to pray? By praying. Just like learning to read. <laughs> Amen. Uh, set you aside a time and pray and pray and pray and pray. Number three, a dedicated giving life. If you stingy with your money, you'll be stingy with your witness. Either that or you just want to witness to rich folks. <laughs> I met a pastor one time, and they, they did, they had a rich church, and I said, Man, live, y'all, y'all got an interesting church here. He said, Yes, we're not really interested in those folks across the tracks. They don't have anything. I thought, well, I wear a nice suit, but I'm telling you, I didn't always do that. Amen. I grew up poor. Ooh. Number four, a daily study life. Get your head in the book. Let God teach you. If all you get is what you get from your pastor three times a week. You are spiritually anemic. Yeah, he's a good preacher. I've heard him preach. But I'm telling you, you need to learn the book. And you do that by studying and memorizing it. Number five, a dedicated church life. God's... <laughs> I had a 92-year-old woman in church that I pastored, and uh, she, was a, she was hilarious. She... She would, uh, every day, every Sunday morning, you'd see her, and she'd looking around. She'd look and look and look and look and look and look and look. And the next Sunday morning, uh, she'd find a young couple that wasn't there, and she'd go to them, and she'd say, How are y'all doing this morning? And they said, Oh, we're doing good. She said, uh, uh, I said, I missed you last Sunday in church. And they'd say, Well, we had this and this and this, didn't And she'd say, Well, I'm 92, and I was here. Hello? <clears throat> Get in church. Get your children in church. Amen. Well, let's look at some different ways to witness, and this is where I want to hone in for a while, if you will. And, uh, folks, this is not complete. Understand that. Uh, every, every, time, every time I go to a church, it seems like I add one to it. Amen. Just uh, look, look at this. The absolute best way to witness set apart a time of prayer and fasting and pray until the Lord sends revival. And when that happens, I'm telling you the most natural thing to happen in the life of the church is for the people of God to be going and saying, hey, listen, come hear this preacher. Hey, come to church. Hey, you need Jesus. <clears throat> Greatest way to witness now, you can be a witness in a cold, dead church. Uh, doubt you'll stay there very long, amen? But the truth of the matter is, when God's, when God's church is on fire for God, then God's people are on fire for God. Amen. When the Lord is in control of the church, the people, the work, witnessing becomes a natural part of everyday life. Amen. Prayer witnessing. What about people? You say, well, I got, a, I got a child, or I got a grandchild, or I got a niece, nephew, or some relative, and they live in New York City. How am I going to witness to them? Get on your knees. Put their name on your prayer list. Listen, God can cover ground. You can't cover ground. Oh, when you talk to them on the phone, you, you may get a chance. As often as not, they'll change the subject, and that's all right. I mean, you know, I, I, I can still give them the gospel, and I understand that. But I'm telling you, the work of the Holy Ghost of God is to, is, is to cover beyond ground. Matter of fact, I, I, one time I, this lady got saved, and I'd been praying for her, but I hadn't prayed for her for the last week. And I said, Lord, can I just catch up on that? I know she got saved, but why can't... Is he the eternal God? Yes. <laughs> Pray. 
Holy Spirit of God has the ability to go anywhere and control any situation, can get the gospel to lost folks you can't get the gospel to. So pray. Luke chapter 5, verse 17, witnessing. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17 and following, here's a fellow that's a paraplegic, and his four friends decide to bring him to Jesus. <clears throat> I guess there's one on each corner of the bed. That's the only thing I can figure. And so they bring him to the Lord, and they can't get in the house. And the reason they can't, Matthew tells us the reason they can't get in the house is because the Pharisees and that whole bunch have filled up the house. Hello? You know churches like that? I do. So they say, well, you know, there's a, there's a staircase on the side of the house, and it goes up top of the house. Let's take him up top of the house. By the way, that must have been a fun ride for a paraplegic who couldn't move. I figured he screamed a little bit, y'all don't drop me. Well, anyway, that's a whole different message, all right? But they get him to the top, and they roll back the, the, the uh, roof of the house, and they lower him down in front of the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus looks at him and says, By your faith be ye healed. No, that's not what he said, was it? What did he say? Their faith. Do you understand that he got saved on their faith? <laughs> Hello. My goodness. <laughs> well, let's apply it. Why can't four of you men get together and, and, and somebody will have to take the bull by the horns, all right? Just understand that. And don't wait on a preacher. Oh, y'all say amen. I, I didn't mean to hang you out there, preacher. I mean, it just happened. And the four of you get together, and here's what you do. You pick a lost man. And you begin to pray over him. You meet every time the church meets. You get here early, 15, 30 minutes later. You fall in the altar and you pray over him. You, you, you pray during the week together. You say, well, we can't do that. We're in different places. Have you ever heard of a conference call? Hello, if you really want, you know, if you really want to do this, you can do it. Every week, at least one person goes by to see him, one of that four. And you may want to take all four the first time. With COVID, I don't know. He may not want you in your house. But anyway, and you're going to give him the gospel every time you go. Find out what the gospel is. Give it to him every time you go. Invite him to church. Matter of fact, if you need to, give him a ride to church. One of the greatest soul winners I ever met was a deacon in church where I grew up. And another deacon, one in the Lord, who went over this heaven revival, and he, he sat down, he sat down on the front porch, and, and, and Al Gann said, "What are you doing?" He said, uh, "I'm waiting on you." He said, uh, "Why?" He said, "Well, you said you'd go to revival, so I'm gonna give you a ride." Shamed him and his wife into going to church for revival, and both of them got saved. Hello. Get him in church. Get him under gospel. Put your, put your testimonies on a stick and give it to him. Hello. But that is your emphasis, that one man and the four of you, until he gets saved. Now you got five in your group, and that's all right. That'll work until somebody else gets saved, and then you can divide your group. And you, <laughs> Hello. You say, well, it sounds kind of like a pyramid scheme to me. Okay. Hello? Now, I don't want you ladies to feel left out, so why don't one of you ladies get three other ladies? <laughs> well, that's real good for my husband. No, 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 it's good for the women, too. And, 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 and you pick a lost lady... Ideally, it'd be the wife of that lost man. Amen. <laughs> and you go after her until she gets saved. You say, well, preacher, that'll take a lot of effort. Yeah, it means you'll have to turn the television off, don't it? 
<laughs> but you see, if the reason we sanctify ourselves and the reason we pray is that lost folks might get saved, then why in the world don't we spend the time seeing them get saved? What about teenagers? Oh, oh I'm not going to leave you all out. Amen. <laughs> Why can't you get three other teenagers? Hello? Listen, here's something I learned. I learned this past year. If I could ever get the teenagers on fire for God, if I could, if I could get just one saved... And they were so saved, the others couldn't even figure them out. I'm telling you, that bunch ever got on fire, the whole church changed. Mm. Say, so well, preacher, oh, listen, it's going to get better. Hang on. Look at the next one. <laughs> Number four, tracks. I love tracks. Now, let me just say something to you. Folks, you can't give away what you don't have. You with me? Amen. This is my favorite track. Some of y'all can't see it. It says, Bad Bob. Amen. Amen. You got your contacts in? Okay. Bad Bob. And then it's got a picture. And what I tell folks is this. I say, this is my name. This is not my picture. And if they laugh, they'll read it. If they don't laugh, just take it back. They're not going to read it. Amen. I even have this in, uh, in Spanish. Pepe al malo. Amen. Gracias a Dios. Es mi nombre, pero no es mi foto. Amen. Find your track. See, this, I love this and it's got my name on it. Amen? Find your track. Find the track God wants you to have. Find the track God wants you to use. Make sure it's a good track. You say, well, I don't know if it is or not. Well, your pastor can tell you if it is. Amen? It ought to have repentance and faith in it for sure. Amen? Use tracks everywhere. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a friend and he goes to Walmart. And he said, once a month, said, I go to Walmart and I give out tracks that I put them on the shelves. I, he said, but I don't put my name on those. He said, they've already told me that if I did that again, that, <laughs> they're going to ban me from Walmart. And I said, oh, okay. Listen, everywhere. We were in, uh, what's my favorite buffet? Oh, yeah, Golden Corral. That's the reason I bring her along. Amen. We were in Golden Corral, and she's up at the food bar, and there's this waitress. And, and I said to her, listen, can, let, let me just give you a track. And, and so I gave her Bad Bob, and I told her, I said, this is my name. This is not my, my picture. And, and, and she kind of smiled, and, and she said, sir, are you a preacher? And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm a Baptist evangelist. She said, good. She said, can I give this away? I said, well, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. She said, there's a fellow named Bob here, and he really needs this. <laughs> you do enough witness, and you get some real surprises. She said to me, she said, do you know why I work here? Now, we're, we're, we're treading ground, and I'm afraid to get on. Amen. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't know why you work here. She said, I don't have to work here. I said, you don't? She said, no. She said, my husband makes over $100,000 a year. She said, I put in 40 hours a week as a waitress here so I can tell people about Jesus. I want to crawl on the table. Here I am. I'm teaching witnessing seminars. And here's a woman that's working 40 hours a week at what a lot of folks would consider a menial job just so she can be a witness. Hello. 
give tracts. Uh, let me give you one. We have left tracks in every rest area from Texas to Virginia. Hello? You say, rest areas? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if they're sitting down, they need something to read. <laughs> I, I know, I'm not supposed to say that, Mom. I'm sorry. <laughs> but listen, folks, use them everywhere. <laughs> The most important thing, listen to the Holy Ghost. There's times when, when the Holy Spirit of God is going to tell you, just give them a track. You say, well, I'm derelict in my duty. Not if that's what God tells you to do. And there's other times when you're going to give somebody a track, and I'm telling you, God will just open it up. Amen. Church invitation witnessing. Uh, we have some cards, and I don't have one with me. Uh, folks, we, we actually came for a week and a half, and we're going to be here nine weeks, ten weeks in this area, and we were going to visit one church, and, uh, and I think it's going to be like 20. <laughs> so there's stuff we didn't bring with us. Amen. Church invitation witnesses. This little card has two questions on it. Number one, where do you go to church? That's the question you ask them. Where do you go to church? And it does not matter. It doesn't matter if they're Catholic. It doesn't matter if they're, they're uh, uh, Episcopalian. It doesn't matter if they're Baptist. It doesn't matter if they're Lutheran, Mormon. makes no difference at all. Okay? Question one, where do you go to church? Question two, why don't you come to our church? And on the back of the card is a map how to get to our church and the hours and my telephone number, my telephone number, Amen. And the telephone number of the church. Hello. Great opportunity. Number six, going to the grocery store. Now, I don't care how bad COVID is, you still got to eat. Amen. Okay, this is me. When I go to the grocery store by myself, I have to try to find stuff because my wife knows where stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's smiling over here. My wife knows where everything is at Kroger. I don't know nothing. So what I do is this. I find some little old lady, and I say, Ma'am, could you help me? And she'll say, well, I'll try. I said, where in the world is the cocoa? My wife does this and she knows the word I have no idea where it is and she'll say well let me show you and she'll show me and I'll say thank you so very much let me give you something this is my name this is hello folks there's all kind of ways you can witness at a grocery store praise God <clears throat> number seven door to door visitation <clears throat> well, preacher, you know, you can't go door to door anymore. Oh, really? And you say, well, folks don't want you around. Well, I know y'all use door hangers. I know that because Brother Greg said he got the idea from you. <laughs> we do it too. But here's what I learned with my door to door visitation. My door-to-door -door visitation is not necessarily church door-to-door -door visitation. My door-to-door -door visitation is where I live. And how I witness is in concentric circles. In other words, I'm going across the street, and I'm going to knock on the door, and I'm going to hang that hanger on there, and there come the door, and I say, listen, I just, I just wanted to come by and, and greet you. You're my neighbor, uh, or how are you doing, Mr. So-and-so? And there's a door hanger with some information. You may not want to let me in because of COVID. But if you'd read that, I'd sure appreciate it. And I'm not going to stand long. Now, in one to three weeks, I'm coming back. This time, I got my Bible under my arm. Amen. I'm looking for souls. And I'm going to knock on the door, and I'm going to say, Hey, Mr. So and so, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good. Did you read that? Well, yeah, I did. I said, Got any questions about that? Well, no, 
not really. I said, well, great. Listen, it tells you how to get saved, and I don't know if you're saved or not. Are you saved? Well, no. I said, listen, if you got a minute, we can just stand right here if you want to, and I'll take my Bible, and we'll just show you. Listen, I'm going for souls. Amen? And you say, well, preacher, why would you do that? Why would you wait two weeks? Here's the reason. Because a lot of times the folks in your neighborhood don't know you from Adam's goat. How many in here know everybody in your neighborhood? Wow, I got what, two? Woo! See, that's our problem. We don't have neighbors any, 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 anymore. We got folks who live next to us. Amen. But I'm going to have that opportunity. Now, here's the thing. If they don't get saved on a second visit, then I got a third visit. And I got a fourth visit. And what's going to happen? I'm going to see them at Walmart and they'd say, Hey, Brother Bob, how you doing? I said, Man, I'm doing good. Now, listen, uh, you've got to remind me. I'm old. Uh, where do I know you from? Oh, we live right across the street and down three houses. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How you doing? Doing well. Now, guess what? Now I got another chance to witness to them. But when I walk up that house the next time and they open the door, they're going to say, Hey, Brother Bob, now they know me. And there's a good possi a possibility I'm going to get invited in. I used to do this when I was pastoring, and it was interesting because a fellow said, to, a pastor said to me, How is it you get in all these houses? I said, It's real simple. I just go see them. He said, What does that mean? I said, you got to walk out your front door. Amen? Number eight, record your testimony. Share, share it on Facebook Live, Instagram Live. Now, I've been trying to do that for a month, and every place that I've given my testimony, uh, uh, the, the camera's messed up. So you pray for that, would you please? Amen? Great. Uh, if you can do it in two minutes, uh, 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. But just share it. Number nine, telephone visitation. I had a lady in church, and she really couldn't get out. She's almost homebound, but she had a telephone. <laughs> Did you know you can meet all kinds of people just dialing random numbers? <laughs> oh, Pastor, I couldn't ever do that. So you're just going to let them go on to hell, huh? <clears throat> Number ten, Bible distribution. We had a fellow in our church named Bill. Bill's an interesting fellow. Uh, <clears throat> I work security when, when I'm back home in church. And, and so one Sunday morning, I, I was asking everybody, when did you get saved? He came in, and he said, I don't know. I said, you don't know when you got saved? No. I said, are you sure you're saved? He said, yeah, I'm sure I'm saved. But you don't know. He said, well, I can't tell you the date. I said, why not? He said, I don't clutter up my mind with stuff like that. I don't even know what date it is today. If I want to know, I'll ask my wife. I told you he's an interesting fellow. <clears throat> I said, okay. He said, but I didn't know where I was. And I said, well, where were you? He said, I was on the back porch. I had a Bible. I was reading it. And as I read it, I said to God, God, if this is true, then I'm lost. Would you please save me? And he said, God saved me. Amen. Amen. But Bill's at Walmart, and he sees a little old canopy down there, and folks are giving away free King James Bibles. So he went down, and he just, I mean, he just joined in. you got to understand, Bill is extremely quiet. And, and he just joined in, and he said, I got to witness several folks, and God planted in his heart. But he asked the fellow, he said, how is it you get to do this on Walmart parking lot? He said, because we're giving them away, not selling them. So there's no profit. <laughs> and that's what Bill does at our church now. Hello? Amen. Uh, witnessing at work and in school. Oh, um, you know, everybody's got six foot and all that. But you still got to talk to folks at work. Amen. And you still got to talk to folks at school. Amen. Number 13. Ask the Lord how to reach people. Now, folks, one of our problems is, as churches 
is that we think comparatively and we're lazy. What are you talking about? Well, if it worked for the church down the road, surely it'll work for our church. Oh, no. I, I was talking to a pastor, and he said, Preacher, he said, you know, we, we've tried to do bus ministry twice. I said, yeah. He said, almost bankrupt the church. He said, bus ministry just not not our thing. God, God just, that's not for our church. But he said, let me tell you what we're doing. And he began to tell me about how they were witnessing. And, and, and well, I mean, God's saving souls, blessing. Now, are you saying, preacher, you don't like bus ministry? I said, no, but I, I, I'm saying, if God wants you in bus ministry, he'll put you in bus ministry. Hello? And the truth of the matter is, somehow, <clears throat> we have reduced witnessing to a program. And folks, anytime you reduce witnessing to a program, then it becomes a legalistic thing. We do it because we have to. And the truth of the matter is that every child of God in this church is called to be a witness. So why don't you just start doing it? Lord, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> oh, I got to quit. <laughs> I, had, I had some young preachers in church with us pastor in Calvary and one Sunday morning they lined up and uh, in my office and they said we need to talk to you and I said why they said you won't let us preach I said what does that mean they said well you do all the preaching I said I'm the pastor <laughs> they said yeah but we don't ever get to preach I said you know what y'all's problem is they said no I said you're lazy it's perezoso in Spanish you're just lazy. And they said, we're not lazy. I said, oh, yeah, you are. I said, how many street corners are there in Paragould, Arkansas? And they said, oh, probably about 400. I said, take your pick. Hello? Now, last year, oh, you knew I was going to tell that, didn't you, Mama? Last year on a Friday night, I was complaining to God. Don't complain to God. God's got a sense of humor. Amen. I was complaining to God, God, I don't have any place to preach Sunday. He said, all right, in the morning on the corner outside the jail. I said, sir, 10 o'clock. Uh, uh, Lord, he said, that's what you told those young preachers years ago. You know, God doesn't forget. Well, anyway, I went. It was misting rain. One person came by, and he, he rolled the window down, sat there for a minute, and shook his head, and went on. But I preached. I turned around and got ready to go, preacher, and every window on the jail was open. <laughs> See, God knows how to do stuff. Ask him what he wants. <clears throat> All right. I got to quit. Let me do one other thing. Is anybody in here working hydraulics? Nobody in this whole place works in hydraulics. Nobody? Uh, all right. Let me take the simplest form of hydraulics, okay? A garden hose. Let's say we hook one end to a hydrant and we turn the water on. What are we going to get out of the other end? Not oil. No. Not corn syrup. Why? Because we put water in it. Let's cap off the other end and put 28 pounds of pressure at the hydrant. What do we got at the other end? Huh? I got 28 pounds here. What do I got down there? 28 pounds. You do work in hydraulics. <laughs> I got 28 pounds. I got the same amount of pressure. Now, hydraulics in a garden hose simply means this. Whatever I put in is what I'm going to get out. To what extent I put it in is the extent I'm going to get it out. 
Amen. You say, well, I'm not leading anybody to the Lord. Do I need to apply that? Whew. See, the truth of the matter is, we really are lazy, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. We are lazy to this extent. We allow the world to take our time. And we call it being entertained. While the world's going to hell, without hope, without help, needing Jesus our father we love you and thank you for loving us Lord we don't even understand why you put up with us but we thank you that you do Lord you bless us in more ways than we can even count we have freedom to worship and freedom to witness and freedom to live for Jesus that's going quick but God help us to use our time well we pray Lord, if there's somebody here that's lost, I pray that they get saved today. Simply ask you for their salvation, your grace, your mercy. Now, Lord, would you help the preacher speak through him, I pray. God, give us a good time of just worshiping you. But, Lord, make it the start of the week instead of the end of the week. We might serve you these days, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.